Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Science Connections. This is a show that is broadcasted by the Muslim Network TV. My name is Rana Dajani, and I'm a professor of molecular cell biology. This show is about exploring nature through science to discover the amazing world around us from quarks to galaxies and everything in between. We will embark on a journey based on our innate curiosity, asking critical questions that lead to even more questions. And on the way, we're going to go through uh, challenges and triumphs and maybe more failures than triumphs uh, in the hope of creating a better life for humanity in harmony with the universe around us. In each episode, we will meet a scientist who will share with us her or his scientific discoveries, and they will share with us their journey of discovery, uh, their uh, stumbles on the way, and their roller coaster journey. And we will also learn from them how their discoveries have made an impact on our lives in a way that we, we can never imagine uh, uh, in the past. So today's episode, we have Professor Hashim and Hashimi from Duke University. He's a professor of biochemistry, and he's going to tell us about the world of RNA biology and large molecules. Welcome, uh, Professor Hashimi. We're so glad to have you. Thanks for having me, Rana. It's, it's a pleasure to be on your show. So we're going to start off by you sharing with us how, how you started your journey. How did you become a scientist? Yeah, you know, I grew up in a household that was filled with scientists in a way. My father is a veterinary scientist and he worked uh, for Big Pharma. So throughout my life, you know, I was always bombarded by issues related to health, whether it was my father's business or also a lot of my extended family are uh, doctors. And so I grew up um, in a place where my father was very passionate about science and he's uh, the kind of person who uh, would make you enthusiastic about whatever he liked. And science was one of those things. And he really made me and my sister uh, fall in love with science, I think. And uh, my sister is also a biochemist. And I think that's really the root of my interest in science. Well, that's amazing. So so can you share with us a, a little bit about the your science and your exciting discoveries? Sure. Uh, so right now, my lab at Duke University is directed at uh, basically developing a microscope that would allow you to visualize, uh, you know, not a living creature, not a heart, uh, not even a cell, but to go down to the individual biomolecules, you know, the DNAs and RNAs of inside cells, which are really, really tiny molecules that you can't see with microscopes. And the goal of my research is to visualize uh, how these molecules, which form beautiful shapes, you know, we all know the beautiful structure of the DNA double helix with the anti-parallel double-stranded ladder. And what we're trying to do is develop this kind of microscope. It's not a microscope, but it's like a microscope that can allow us to visualize how molecules like DNA uh, jiggle and wiggle. So how their conformations continuously change with time because they're continuously being bombarded by water molecules and how these molecules change shape turns out to be very important for how they actually function inside cells. So you, it makes sense that we always think of life as dynamism and movement and transformation. And you can see this kind of dynamism all the way down to the individual biomolecules inside cells, but it's very hard to visualize these motions uh, and to because they're very short-lived uh, transitions and they involve very small uh, movements. And so we're developing a technique called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is similar to MRI, except that it's being performed on a very small sample, uh, looking at the biomolecules and understanding how they jiggle and wiggle turns out to be very important for how molecules interact with one another, because what happens inside every cell is that certain molecules hug other molecules. And if you ever were to hug somebody, your, your body changes because you're going to, you know, grab them. And in a very similar way, molecules also do that. And in order to understand how tightly they hug each other and their propensities to not want to hug each other anymore, one needs to know these mechanical motions so you can see how the arms move around when, when it comes in the act, when the act of hugging occurs. So my lab is developing these tools to image these motions, looking at particularly RNA 
and DNA molecules, which constitute the genetic molecules inside cells. Well, this is amazing. So as you study the interaction of these molecules with each other, I want to highlight you're not just looking at biology, you're looking at chemistry and physics. So this is very interdisciplinary work. And, and as you said, uh, uh, life and nature is very dynamic and very fluid. So actually the separation of disciplines, chemistry, physics, biology, today we're seeing a blurring of those boundaries and people from all these disciplines working together to be inspired and to help solve the challenges that you face. So could you share with us a little bit about how that those multiple uh, disciplinary approaches have enriched your research? Yes, uh, you know, that's actually one of my favorite aspects of the research that we conduct. So the technique that I mentioned, if you look at magnetic resonance imaging or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, those are imaging technologies that really are based on physics. So the, in particular, in the case of NMR, the, the technique is based on quantum mechanics. And so in order to be able to use this technique to visualize biology, my students have actually have to understand quantum mechanics to us as quite a level, <coughs> excuse me, in order to be able to perform these experiments. But in it, so what they do is they end up preparing biological samples with the use of molecular biology, but then they put it into this big magnet, the superconducting magnet, which is engineered based on the, obviously the, 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 the principles of engineering, but that basically works on the basis of quantum mechanics. And then they collect data, which I would call quantum mechanical data, <coughs> although it's not, it's on the basis of, it, it, it relies on the principles of quantum mechanics. And, and furthermore, when we study the movements and the shaking of the molecules, these interactions are governed by the laws of physics, of course. And so then physics comes in, in terms of rationalizing the hugging and, and the interactions. And then of course, all of this has consequences on physiology, you know, cell biology and physiology. And so you're absolutely right that there's a blurring of the disciplines and we take a very multidisciplinary approach to be able to do the kinds of work that we're doing. Wow, so so this that's why it's so important to study basic science. And even if, say, somebody's interested in biology and, and they have to take a physics course, this is fundamental to their approach and understanding later as they make those discoveries and trying to answer the, the scientific questions that come to mind to explore nature and, and around them. Speaking of nature, you're sitting outside, and that's so amazing, uh, uh, you know, being in touch with nature. So what, what made you, I mean, in your work, in your everyday work, as you ask those questions and seek those answers through your scientific experiments and scientific thinking, um, could you tell us more about that? Like what happens in your lab? Uh, how, how do you come up how, about a question? How do you approach it? How do you engage with your students? Yeah, you know, so I, I think many of the ideas, so most of the work that we do relates in one shape or other on the question of how a molecule is moving around uh, and trying to, uh, but, but there are many different types of questions surrounding this. And oftentimes what happens more often than not is that a student makes an observation that we did not expect and that it puzzles us. You know, so you norm we normally start with the premise in the lab. We say we have this hypothesis based on everything we know and we believe that this experiment should yield the result A if the hypothesis is true. But the fun part of science is oftentimes the result that you expect is not the one that you see. And in those cases, that poses a question then. So what's going on? And it's a, it's a, it becomes a very fun uh, task for my trainees, students and postdocs, for myself to begin to think about this. And I think the most productive times are <clears throat> when we all meet together to talk about this. My lab happens to have I would say very unusual group meetings in the sense that we meet every week uh, on, on and on Monday mornings, and our lab meetings can go for for quite a while. I think the record was eight hours. Oh wow! Uh, but, but but the but the standard is two to three hours, you know, and it's during this period where everybody gets to weigh in with their thoughts and ideas that I think have been the most productive. And I would I have many many memories of specific group meetings that led to new insights, and it's really a, a team effort so well yeah absolutely <laughs> team effort it's uh, it's about many brains coming together interacting um uh, critiquing each other in the in the uh, uh, objective of discover making a discovery or understanding the phenomena and the results that you obtain in your lab uh, can, do you remember any one of those uh, memories that you just mentioned uh, or stories that you'd like to share with us 
Oh, there's there are lots and lots. Um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to single one of them out because I don't want to make one stand over the other. Uh, but I could say that I can tell you maybe something else. Maybe uh, instead of that, I'll tell you another story, which is my first idea as a graduate student. Yo, so, amazing. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, sure. yeah, because this was something else I remember. So go back in, I, at some point I was, you know, walking from my home to, to, to work. And during these walks, I would always think about, I would ponder the question that I was dealing with, you know, and so walking and thinking, now I run every day and I think about my scientific questions while I run. But um, I remember I was walking to, to school and to the lab. And during my walk, I had, uh, I had, a, a, I had this idea about how I could solve a problem that I'd been working on for a long period. And the walk was about 10 minutes. And I think by the time I started the walk until I finished the walk, I had thought through the entirety of the idea and I knew it was going to work and I knew it was going to solve the problem. And I was so excited uh, that I just ran directly to my advisor's office and he completely saw it you know, as well. And so I, I will never forget that. That's just because that was my first idea that that obviously I had many ideas that don't work. Most 99% of your ideas don't work. This was one idea which the, my first idea that actually did work. That's a, that's so important what you pointed out that we're, we don't succeed in every instance, and and the journey of discovery is is going through different bumps on the road, uh, paths not or taken or dead ends, uh, but all of them are learning experiences. Uh, so uh, could you share with us a story about? Uh, uh, a challenge. I don't want to call it a failure. Something that you thought would work and didn't work, and how you dealt with it, and how it enriched the your scientific journey. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, there's there are several stories. Maybe I'll, I'll tell you a couple, just because there's they come in different flavors. Um, one story was that I was working with another. This was again when I was a student, but I'll come back to a professor. You know, uh, story later. Um, we were working on an experiment. And had stayed, I think, two nights in a row working on ma preparing materials because the experiment required that you made the sample and immediately collected the data because the molecules went bad very quickly. And after all this painstaking preparations, we had spent maybe a month, uh, you know, planning out the experiment, planning out what we were going to do. And I, and we were very, you know, our, we had high hopes that this was going to work. We put the sample inside the machine, and we were expecting to see a signal comprising two lines you know if you see one line the experiment didn't work if you see two lines the experiment worked we put the sample in and we get one line and we sat there for about three hours trying to work it out and understand what was going on it was always one line at some point this is three in the morning me and my colleague uh, decided my friend decided to step outside to just get some fresh air so we went outside and we're chatting about how this was going to change our plans and what what, what how what are we going to do about this so we, instead of just going home, we decided, let's just go back and take one last peek at the machine before we call it, you know, quits. Because there was no reason for this to work, you know, it wasn't supposed to work over time. We went back to the machine and it was a dark room with the monitor was on. You could see it from far away. And from far away, we could see two lines because the machine was collecting the data, you know. And to me, that was an example where you really can't give up in science. You know, the, one of the key lessons was that it's easy to think when you hit a block, a roadblock, that this is the end. But it could be that success is literally around the corner, you know. And and of course, it's not always the case, but sometimes it is. In my in my own lab work, there has been so many instances where we were we thought we were on track, and then realized that everything we were doing was either wrong or fundamentally <laughs> impossible. And I think it takes the um, the passion of the students in addition, postdocs, in addition to the PI who fuel the energy to, you know, continue to persevere in the face of major challenges. And because, you know, in science, as you said, most of the work you do is, is failed, is failure. If you're not failing, you're probably not doing a great job doing science. Uh, because, or, or I shouldn't say that, but, you know, if you're, if every experiment you do gives you the outcome you expect, then it's, you probably are not doing the experiments that are the right, the best experiments, you know. But the students, um, there was another occasion where, as I said, the experiment was not working, and this required that we prepared or the student prepared, I don't know, 24 samples in the face of this major obstacle. And I think it's the passion for science, and the 
uh, camaraderie in a lab uh, to support one another and provide an environment that that says, you know, you're doing great, you know, and, you know let's keep keep at it. And and sure enough, in this particular occasion, we prepared all the samples from scratch, did everything from the beginning after having done it for over a year, and it, it panned out at the end, you know. Well, that, that's amazing. Yeah, perseverance, perseverance, perseverance. Oh, wasn't there somebody who said uh, 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 success is 1% genius and 99% per, uh, persistence? Well, let's take a break and we'll come back to continue uh, learning more about your research and, and how that impacts our everyday life. A free online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. Our fellow Americans. Right now, the COVID-19 vaccines are available to millions of Americans. And soon, they will be available to everyone. The science is clear. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. They could save your life. So we urge you to get vaccinated when it's available to you. That's the first step to ending the pandemic and moving our country forward. It's up to you. Dad, they took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Find her. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back, everybody to this episode uh, uh, of a conversation with Professor Hashim El Hashimi, uh, Professor of Biochemistry at Duke University. Uh, uh, professor Hashimi works in the world of large molecules, uh, specifically uh, proteins and nucleic acids. So do you want to elaborate more about your scientific discoveries uh, and, uh, and the excitement of those discoveries as well? <clears throat> yeah, sure. So. Um, my lab started by based on the premise that molecules like DNA are not um, rigid, but instead are actually quite mobile and dynamic. And certainly we were not the ones to first propose this idea. This was known many decades before. Uh, the challenge was to really pinpoint how were they moving exactly? You know, what were the motions? What were the fluctuations? And in, in addition, what were their biological consequences? How did they play a role in for example, how proteins in, or our nucleic acids interact, or how might they play roles in disease even. So I'll maybe mention a couple of discoveries, one of which is that it relates to the DNA double helix. So over the course of time, me and my uh, trainees developed a class of NMR experiments that could be applied to study the dynamics of DNA molecules. And at the time when we had developed those experiments and those experiments themselves, are based on work done over many, many decades. Uh, but we had taken those experiments and made them suitable to study and visualize nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. And in the first instance, our goal was to show that the experiments work by studying a very boring molecule and showing the experiments tell us the molecule is not moving at all. So for instance, the DNA double helix, we all know is a well-defined shape and it's highly celebrated. And we thought that this would be a great negative control, meaning that if we were to use the experiment on DNA, we would see nothing interesting because we all know DNA is this well-defined double helix. I mean, we thought molecules would be dynamic, but DNA in particular seemed like a good bet that it would be pretty rigid, right? Because it's a very well-defined structure. It's been studied for decades. So the idea was this was, would be our negative control. Then we would move to the more flamboyant RNA molecules 
RNA, by its own nature, is a much more flamboyant, dynamic, interesting molecule. It's not this regular double helix. And to our surprise, when uh, the student did the experiment on the DNA molecule, what she observed was very interesting motions in DNA, which were completely unexpected. And this is another example of how, as I mentioned earlier, where sometimes you do an experiment and you get an unexpected result. And so for the longest time, we thought something was wrong with our experiment that we were doing things wrong and we were getting spurious signals that, that, that were meaningless. But fortunately, I had a very talented student working on this project. And together we were able to, sh able to show that what was happening in the DNA is that, and you know, as many of us know, the DNA double helix has, is almost like a ladder and each step of the ladder is comprised of two, base, two bases, for example, guanine and cytosine or adenine and thiamine. And what we were able to show was that in DNA, the, the adenine, for example, in an AT base pair is constantly flipping back and forth like a pizza. You know, it's not still, but it's continuously changing. And likewise, in a GC base pair, the G is constantly flipping back and forth. And so this really challenged the idea that the double helix is this still object with Watson and Crick base pairs. And it was really to us very scary at the time when we published this result because we thought how could this have not been observed by anyone else you know and and you know in the, given that dna is one of the most studied molecules of all time and these alternative base pairs are called hookstein base pairs they were discovered many years before not in the context of dynamics but in the context of a still structure by somebody called hookstein and we're now in the process of so you're in your genome right now uh, roughly 1% of the base pairs in your DNA are not Watson and Crick, we think. Uh, they're, pro they're Hookstein. And these kinds of base pairs, these di this dynamism in the DNA, we think provides DNA much more character and much more functionality. And if you want to think about it in a certain way, it's almost like having a zip code where the numbers can change on occasion to mark, for example, a change in the status of a particular cell to mediate various biological interactions. So this is the one example on DNA. I can tell you another example on RNA, but I'll let you let me tell me if I yeah. should. I want to ask you about that just quickly. So, th so those dynamic changes in, in those particular base pairs that constitute the 1% of our genome, is that uh, as a result of impact of the environment? So is this part of epigenetics or this is a random uh, process that's happening all the time? That, that's a great question. So the, the dynamics that I am talking about is random. And it is the consequence of the fact that molecules, water molecules are constantly bombarding your DNA. And as a consequence, no, you know, there are more than one confirmations available. But what can happen is that when a protein hugs the DNA, uh, certain proteins like to hug DNA in the Hookstein form. So they basically wait till the DNA has these Hookstein base pairs, if you will, and then they hug the DNA. They don't like to hug the Watson and Crick. And so it once bound to a protein, Rana, you're right, the environment can make it so that rather than being 1%, so although it's 1% in the absence of a protein, when the protein hugs the DNA in the bound complex, what we call a complex, the Hookstein will become 99%. So, uh, and there's these constant changes in the probabilities which occur in response to the environment. You mentioned epigenetic marks. Uh, Chemical modifications could, in principle, cause changes in these dynamics. We haven't seen something that really stands out yet. But certainly, if you have, for example, uh, damaged DNA, DNA that's um, you know, in trouble, the regions around that damaged site can be more predisposed to forming Hookstein. And we think, although this is just a, theory, a hypothesis right now, that this could send signals to repair proteins, proteins that fix DNA, so that they can find where the damage is in a sea of undamaged nucleotides. Well, wow, so so th these particular uh, nucleotides that you are you've you're working on and trying to understand their their three dimensional formation and how that impacts the function of DNA and therefore the biology of the cell. This is this is amazing. And 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 you mentioned I think something very very important, which is this uh, kind of confidence, this trust in, uh, trust in your gut feeling that when you see an experiment result and then it keeps repeating, not to say oh this is just an artifact. But to think, wait, there is something here, and to pursue that. And I think that's one of the hallmarks of, of being a scientist, right? It's seeing what everybody sees, but thinking what no one has thought. 
so yeah, please share the other story as well. Yeah, so the, then the you know for the other story, we were looking at RNA. As I mentioned, RNA is more flamboyant. And so um, one of the interesting things about RNA molecules, so many, so nowadays in particular, there's great interest in uh, drugging RNAs, you know, finding drugs that can bind to RNA molecules. So most of the pharmaceutical drugs that are present today bind the protein molecules. The protein molecules are the workhorses of cells. You know, they're the, they're the things that catalyze chemical reactions, all the enzymes, all the receptors. Um, but over the last few decades, we, it's become clear that in addition to proteins, your DNA makes a whole lot of RNA. So, you know, the central dogma says DNA produces RNA, and then the RNA is used to make proteins, and proteins are basically the workhorses of cells. But now this picture has changed dramatically because we know that many RNA molecules that are made aren't, aren't there necessarily to produce proteins, but instead they have sort of functions of their own, uh, mostly involving regulating when and where the proteins are made. And these RNA molecules now are providing a potential for a new class of drugs that act by not binding to proteins, but instead binding to RNAs. But this is still work in progress, you know, and, and one of the interesting and curious aspects of RNAs was that if you look at RNA structures, um, what you often find is we, there's this one particular RNA molecule from HIV that we have been studying for many years called TAR, and this RNA molecule has very different shapes depending on which drug binds to it. So every time it binds to a small molecule drug, the, the shape of the molecule is different. And the question was, how does this happen? You know, how does, how does it, how is it that each drug, you know, binds the RNA and causes a different shape to occur? And so what we did was develop, me and my trainees developed NMR methods that allowed us to visualize without any drug present, you know, what is the RNA doing in terms of its three-dimensional shape? And to our amazement, what we discovered is that the RNA on its own was morphing between all the different shapes that were observed when the drugs bound, which meant that the RNA molecule is dynamic even before the drugs show up. And each drug has an appetite for different shapes. You know, So one drug may bind shape A, another one might bind shape B, but the shapes were not induced by the drug, so to speak. They were already present in the dynamism of the RNA molecule. And just seeing that result was, was very exciting to us because it meant that the driving force was really the dynamism of the RNA molecule and not the binding per se. Well, so so what you're saying here first what I, uh, is that um, if somebody had studied a particular molecule or a particular phenomena and drew a conclusion in the past, that it's still worth going back and making new observations. First, maybe because uh, tools and technology have advanced, so you may be able to see something that in the past was not um, visible. And also, it's a new perspective. Somebody would, could come in fresh and see something that others haven't noticed and and uh, and make a whole new discovery on the same molecule. So this dynamism, again, I see that uh, reflected in the, at the level of thinking and, and scientific discovery as well. And, and the other thing you, you, you mentioned about this uh, uh, these uh, multiple formations in three dimension of the RNA molecule uh, and, and how that is so natural. It happens as they're tumbling around, like you said, bombarded by other molecules, flipping from uh, formation to formation and maybe being locked in by a particular drug. Um, I, I couldn't help but thinking of somebody dancing on a dance floor uh, and, and to visualize all, this, uh, all these molecules in, in a real life uh, scenario. Uh, to make it more uh, understandable, uh, comprehensible for the uh, for the general public. Have you thought of doing something like that? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a great point, Rana, and I think it really uh, touches on something very important. So much of science is complicated because we don't fully understand what is going on. You know, if you could actually, if I showed you a movie of a molecule binding another molecule, you know, you would see it and you would understand it. The problem is that we don't have the tools to fully visualize these, 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 these interactions. So instead, we end up using things like kinetics, a very technical field that describes what we know of the phenomena, which is not the full story. So instead, you almost need to learn a whole new language because we don't have the full picture. But it, it, once you have the full picture, 
then understanding a lot of this science is becomes much easier. So, so the question, you know, we've, I've, in my lab, we have uh, a passion for, and in fact, to some degree, my, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting. It was me and a student. So in the past, before we had actual movies showing how these things move around, I shouldn't call them movies. They're more uh, pictures that sh images that show the different formations, you know, that a molecule can have. We don't know the order with which some of these transitions occur. But nevertheless, they are they give you a sense of the different uh, shapes a molecule can adopt. And when we uh, began to do this work, you, you were not in the business of showing the shapes. You could only say, you know, this part of the molecule moves a lot. This part of the molecule moves a little. This, you know, and these, these numbers would be provided, but you wouldn't see a picture, you know, of what's going on. And one of the driving forces, I think, of our lab that's been very helpful is this quest to getting the movie. You know, we still don't have a full movie. And it came about through interactions with my trainees, you know, where we thought enough of this qualitative description, you know, let's try to get at the real movie. And I think that as an objective has been a very healthy one because when you see the movie, I think it reveals a lot about science, a lot of scientific principles that you could never achieve by, by having these incomplete descriptions of the dynamics. Yeah, and I think that's the driving force, right? That that keeping that excitement, the the spice <laughs> in life, working up every morning, wanting to push th that uh, uh, discovery a little bit more, uh, in order to see finally, at some point, of course, uh, the, the movie. But then uh, those dynamics, I'm sure, every day you'll discover something new, and then there's another question, another uh, transformation that you want to address. Uh, so maybe, you know, there was this uh, this competition about dance your PhD. Maybe that would be a good idea for one of your students <laughs> to, to do that with the RNA. <laughs> well, so actually my, my students have produced beautiful images which compare the, so they took very uh, photographs of themselves dancing, uh, long exposure photographs, and then uh, took pictures of themselves doing that, and then pictures of the RNA and DNA molecules dancing and produced beautiful art. Uh, it's not a video. I agree with you. A video would be also interesting. And in fact, they, they, this was uh, showcased at one of the art exhibitions at Duke University. And they're, they're trying to uh, win some competitions with this. But, but I agree with you, like an actual dance uh, uh, would be a very interesting way to, to express this concept. And, and I think uh, uh, talking about this interaction between the arts and science is very important because it helps us understand and visualize uh, more and gives us a, a, a wider perspective, which, you know, it's all about the imagination, right? For us to imagine uh, what could what could be possible and then try to answer those questions as we go forward. Um, so so when, uh, as we go, so you're, with your discoveries, I mean, you talk about uh, the, the drugs and how they bind RNA. Uh, this is the new field uh, for, for different diseases. Could you elaborate on the impact of your discoveries on everyday life of, of, you know, just everyday people? Yeah, you know, I think my my research is on fundamental science, you know. So right now, our goal is to uh, develop an understanding about how molecules interact with one another. And so uh, I think the first impact it has is on scientists who want to understand truth and understand, you know, the principles of, of, of biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, now, of course, sci science always has, or not always, sometimes can lead to uh, important translational applications. Uh, and although that is not our goal, of course, uh, you can be ready to receive, uh, you know, uh, discoveries that might have impact. And, you know, uh, I think in the course of my research, as I mentioned before, it turns out that the dynamic ensembles or these the dynamism of RNAs is an important parameter when it comes to predicting whether or not a drug will bind an RNA. And so something like 11 years ago, I so I patented this technology roughly 11 years ago and co-founded a company uh, uh, called Nymerum, which is using this technology to advance drugs targeting RNAs. And so this is the work now, not at Duke, but at a company which is trying to kind of uh, drug RNAs uh, based on their dynamism. Uh, on another app, another I think application is the question of mutagenesis. So as as probably you know, uh, you know diseases like cancer are the consequence of mutations uh, going out of control, and so understanding how mutations happen uh, is an important goal that has 
direct implications for our ability to detect and perhaps even uh, you know, treat various forms of cancer. And uh, one of the interesting uh, discoveries that we made was that, and I can tell you about this additional scientific, how dynamism leads to mutations. Now, mutations, by the way, of course, are also critical to drive evolution because we need diversity. And if we didn't have mutations, we wouldn't have diversity. We couldn't have Darwinian evolution. But too much mutation, and then you get cancer. So, you know, you have to, uh, organisms evolve to adapt their mutation rate to be just right. And so the question I, is... Sorry, can I just interrupt you for you to define for us mutations? What yeah, do you mean for the, our general audience? Yes, of course. So so uh, when a given living organism has its DNA, which is a sequence of letters, you know, G, A, T, and C, and during a replication, what has to happen is this, uh, uh, if you will, uh, you know, billion uh, billions of letters long uh, word has to be copied uh, in order to uh, generate uh, two copies for the two offspring, for the two daughter cells. And this is done by a uh, by machinery inside the cells, which are, if you want to call them photocopiers, that go along and they photocopy that series of letters and produce the corresponding copy. Now, if things go correctly, uh, then the entire uh, uh, series of letters are copied without any error. But on rare occasions, there's, you know, the system makes a typo. And, you know, instead of G, it, it writes C. And when that happens, if it's not corrected, this typo, because there are, uh, just like when we write essays, we will proofread it and see if there's a mistake and fix it. Likewise, in cells, there are proofreading machineries that look and check if there are any errors and typos. But sometimes, you know, a typo will evade the proofreading machinery, just like in our case, we make typos when we write essays. And when that happens, that gets immortalized because you've changed the genetic makeup of the daughter cells. That, that particular nucleotide has forever been changed. And so the genetic sequence has been changed, and that's called a mutation. Now, when you have such a change, the consequence of it is that it could, depending on where the mutation happens, it could lead to a change in the protein molecule that the cell is using the DNA as instructions for making. And that new protein molecule, in most cases, if you start messing with what a protein molecule is, you will make it probably unhappy, you know. But in some rare occasions, you can make it better. And in that, in particularly under certain conditions. And so mutations in such a way is a source of evolution, of adaptation that is fundamental for, for, the, for life as we know it. But in some situations, especially when the proofreading machines, for example, are, are not working as well, uh, you could end up with too many typos, and too many typos can, if they're in the wrong place, can cause uh, so, uh, the kinds of uh, changes in protein molecules that result in diseases such as cancer. So mutations are really fundamental in in all aspects of of biology, including you know cancer disease. And one of the things that so you can ask the question: Well, how does the machinery make perfect copies of the DNA? How is it so precise? And how does an error occur? And I can tell you the science behind that, if that's of interest, Rana. But I'll let you, you know, let me know. If you're, you're no, no, so you were talking about mutations and how that is involved in your work. And I just wanted to make sure that the audience understood what is what is a mutation. Uh, so please continue about the drugs and RNA and the, the mutations and, and, and yeah. your research. Right. So, so the question is, you know, how is it that um, mutations take place? Uh, and how is it that... To, to phrase the question more specifically, how does the copying machine make a mistake? And something that's been known for quite some time, this dates back to the discovery of the DNA double helix. This idea was put forward and I'll explain it to you briefly. Basically this photocopying machine, uh, the way it knows how to copy DNA very accurately is it does the following thing. Uh, it, it, it will go along the DNA, here's a DNA strand, it will go along it and make copies and the way it makes the copy is that it insists it takes two pieces of two Lego pieces. And if they fit snugly like this, these are the two bases, you know, like a G and a C or an A and a T. So it's almost like taking two pieces of two Lego pieces. And, you know, if they fit into this beautiful rectangular shape to form like a, you know, a, a larger Lego piece, the enzyme, this, this copier recognizes that rectangular shape. If it looks rectangular, it says good to go, accept if it looks 
like an irregular rectangle, like an irregular shape, it knows that's not the right, that's going to that's gonna be a typo, so avoid it. So this particular enzyme has evolved to essentially recognize that only things that form rectangles should be printed, but if it looks like an irregular shape, you should reject it. And so therefore, if you take a G and pair it with the C, it forms a beautiful rectangle and the, and the enzyme prints it. On the other hand, if you take a G and mispair it with a T, it forms an irregular shape. The enzyme notices it's an irregular shape and rejects it. So now the question is, how is it that the polymerase makes mistakes and on a rare occasion prints this GT even though it has an irregular shape? And the hypothesis that was proposed back when the during the discovery of the DNA double helix by uh, Jim Watson and Francis Crick, what they proposed was that on rare occasions, this mismatch, irregular structure, might morph into a regular rectangular looking shape through a process that involves tautomerization. It's a chemical transformation of the bases so that now a GT can conform to this rectangular shape. And what we discovered was that and these shapes were observed in uh, what's called crystallographic static structures of proteins uh, with DNA. And what we observed was that in a DNA, we could observe this motion happening continuously. If you take a G and a T, what you'll notice is on rare occasion, it will morph into a rectangular shape. And the frequency with which this occurs is an important frequency of how often a mutation will happen. So in other words, the dynamism of the DNA and its propensity to morph between irregular and rectangular shapes turns out to be, we believe, and, and to be an important determinant of the frequency with which uh, mutations take place. And you can imagine various environmental factors, chemical modifications impact uh, this dynamic process uh, to cause, to increase the mutations. Uh, so for example, there are many forms of damage that cause this kind of shape to form more readily. And as a consequence, increasing the mutation rates and as a consequence, predisposing the system to, to uh, you know, various forms of genetic disease. So uh, these mutations therefore are an interesting area for us in terms of developing a deeper understanding about the early processes that ultimately can lead to diseases such as cancer, but also which drive uh, life and evolution. Uh, that's the cancer uh, connection. We don't do the, and increasingly now we're finding this to be an interesting, uh, although we never started this research with the interest in looking at cancer, uh, we we discover as often happens in science is that there are some interesting connections and we're now trying to develop those connections further. I can tell you about the RNA drug discovery, but that's uh, that's another story. If you if you would like me to talk about that too. No, no, absolutely. So, and like you said, that you, you're on one path, and then you make a discovery that enriches another path. Uh, and this is like the serendipity of science, and that's why we have to be aware and meet and talk and share, so that we can uh, be inspired by each other's discoveries to think anew about our own. Uh, so very, very important. Uh, and yes, we'd love to know more about how your work are on RNA. Uh, and those drugs has has led to you know some impact on reducing or potential of reducing diseases such as cancer and others. Uh, yeah, we'd love you to elaborate on that. Yeah. As well. yeah. So so again, uh, I would say that you know I wish I could tell you that our research has already resulted in this or that drug, uh, but that's it's still it's still too early. Uh, this field is very you know science takes a long time often to to mature you know into you know, uh, into outcomes that have impact on society. So I think in this particular uh, field, it's still quite early, but I can tell you that our work uh, has, I think, helped to, uh, you know, to create awareness about the importance of these dynamisms when it comes to the uh, drug discovery against RNAs and increasingly uh, 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 various scientists and pharmaceutical companies that are trying to target RNAs with small molecules to find cures are taking into consideration the dynamism of the RNA uh, to increase the effectiveness of their approaches. In our hands, you know, one of the major accomplishments that, we, that I'm proud of is that, you know, one of the dreams, I think, for many scientists is to produce a predictive understanding of, of you know, biochemistry and molecular biology. So what I mean by that is, 
you know, oftentimes what we do as scientists is we describe what we see. You know, I see this molecule binding that molecule and I register the observation. And then I have a, a collection of observations that are very descriptive of the system. I, I think all of us scientists want more than that. What we want to be able to do is one day be able to predict, you know, if you tell me your molecule, I will tell you whether or not it will bind this other molecule. I will tell you how tightly it will bind it. And I will tell you what shape they will be when they're hugging. So basically I want to be able to predict who's going to hug who and in what way will they hug them? Will they hug them with two hands, with one arm, with one kiss, you know? And science, I think at its very best, seeks to have a predictive understanding of these interactions. And so the question I think that we, and if you take biological systems, uh, the fundamental unit, if you will, of, of function in biological systems is the biomolecule and their interactions. If we can predict those interactions and understand them very deeply, one day we might be able to predict, although this is maybe a, a distant day, how, how cells behave when you add a drug or how living organisms behave when you add a drug. And what I'm very particularly proud of is that we've been able to take our, this dynamism, I think turns out to be an important missing puzzle piece when it comes to taking this understanding of, of biomolecules and transforming it into a predictive tool where we can say, I can predict whether or not this drug binds the RNA, yes or no. So one of the studies that we did was showed that if we take the dynamic landscape of RNAs and take computers to predict whether or not drugs bind to this, not one structure, but a dynamic landscape of structures, that one can do very well or reasonably well predicting which drugs will bind, which ones will not on a computer without ever needing, I mean, of course, you have to verify with experiments. And I think that that direction of, pre, of moving biochemistry and molecular biology from a descriptive science to one that's actually predictive, just like physics, you know, we predict the weather all the time. But if you ask the question, do we predict anything in biology that is at the atomic level? You know, we don't, we don't rarely can we actually predict the outcome of a big perturbation to a cell, right? You, instead, you do the experiment. Well, you know, that's, you know, so that we would like to reach the next level where we can actually make predictions about what's going to happen based on this dynamism of molecules. Absolutely. That's the dream of, of, of science, right? That I can punch into an algorithm of some sort, um, the, the different components, the cells I want to use, the drug, the mutation, and then see, is it going to work or not? And then I test it on humans directly uh, to save, you know, to save uh, time, to save uh, money, but most importantly, to, to ethically. To, to order to um, not to do all the experiments on a, on a let's say on a human being or or other animals but to be able to predict it uh, that's the ultimate dream like you said but it's all based on basic science and incremental small steps uh, that ultimately will reach that goal and, and even when you re we reach that goal we're going to have more questions and so on because really I mean biology and nature is so complex and we only know what we know and we can never know what we don't know, right? So, so yeah, so it's, it's fascinating. Let's take a quick break and then come back to learn more about your journey. We are Justice For All. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all.
Find out how to use an awkward silence to help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. Welcome back. So we've been on a journey with uh, Professor El Hashimi uh, uh, discovering large molecules and how they impact uh, biology and, and how they move around and how that, that movement that we would think is trivial is so important in shaping who we are today, even maybe how we think. <laughs> I want to uh, put that in as an imagination. So uh, Professor El Hashimi, can you share with us, um, how, in, from your perspective, how important your basic science is for the general public and what can the general public whether it's adults and parents or youth what can they do to push this forward yeah I, you know i i think it's it's very uh, difficult to understate how important basic science is uh for society especially during these this period we're in the middle of a pandemic and much of the advances that we're seeing with the vaccines that have been developed against COVID-19 are thanks to decades of basic science research or fundamental science research trying to understand the basic behavior of biomolecules. And I think that it's really important for us in society to encourage our, uh, you know, our kids, our students to see the beauty of, of science. It's not only in terms of its innate beauty for what it is, but also in terms of the dividends that you get at the end of the day uh, through its impact on uh, society and, and its impact particularly on health. And I also would like to say that I see science as a force for peace because science is a global enterprise with uh, many, many countries involved. And it's a wonderful way to bring communities from different parts of the world uh, to share in this common uh, goal of being able to uncover the truths of life and be able to then create technologies that make our lives better and, 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 and provide uh, us with, with, with a more enriched um, uh, life. I personally really uh, found this career. I think it's crazy that I'm paid to do this job. It's a, it's a remarkable job. Uh, and I have, and I, it also keeps you very young because you you grow older, but your trainees are always the same age, right? <laughs> That's uh, true. Yeah. So I, 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 I think, uh, I think it's the, it's, what, it's just the best job that anyone could have. And I think there are, in science, of course, has many different manifestations in industry and many different ways. You can be a scientist in so many different ways uh, that I really think it's important that we encourage basic science and not always look for the application. You know, there's often a tendency to want to see right now, you know, people are impatient, you know, how is this going to cure this disease? How is this going to, you know, allow us to go to the moon faster? I think it's very important that you want to understand that no great scientific discovery, as far as I can tell, was ever the consequence of a pre, you know, pre, pre, predetermined plan of, you know, I'm going to de develop computers. Computers were developed to answer a, a logical problem uh, by Alan Turing that had nothing to do with computers. He, he invented them for, for completely unrelated reasons. You know, the internet came about because of studies of quantum mechanics that have nothing to do with the internet. And so I think it's important that society also be patient and let the scientists do their work and just support it, give them the freedom, and great things will happen. That's amazing advice. What you're saying is to foster that innate curiosity that we are all born with, right? That's how we evolved as a species, and that's how we survived. And we need to ensure that we, we allow and create an environment uh, to encourage our children to start asking, because they start asking, and then sometimes, unfortunately, parents stifle them. So keep those questions rolling, uh, whether you're a parent or you're a teacher, or even you know somebody walking in the street, and and keep that wonder, you know, never lose that sense of wonder about the universe and the nature around us, because that's that's what makes us special and unique in in in, in, in you know dealing with the world around us. Uh, so and go and ask your local scientists. Go meet people like Professor Hashimi. You know, knock on their door, ask them what they're doing, and we encourage scientists to also open their doors and reach out and and have a conversation. Because it's only when we have, uh, as Professor Hashimi said, it's all about trust. We have to trust each other. We have to work together. And that's the only way we can create a better world for the, for the future, uh, for all of humanity. Thank you very, very much, Professor Hashimi, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So this was a great episode. And we're looking forward to our next episode, where we will be talking with a professor of physics to learn more about the galaxies around us. See you next time.